And we work with these perspectives. And we ought to work with these perspectives. The aerial perspective, the POV, as it were, of cosmic consciousness, of the universal consciousness, and deeply, intimately individual, as well as that perplexing juxtaposition of peace whilst the war settles their affairs. Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace is universally acknowledged as one of the greatest classics of the 19th century. In fact, it enjoyed the work, enjoyed its recognition almost as soon as it was published. Composed sometimes in the 60s of the 19th century and roughly 100 years before I was born, it was published first in the Russian Good Messenger periodic and then a few years after as an independently standing novel. It was called a novel and one of the biggest novels. For those of you who may not be famili not familiar with the work, it contains 2,000 personages, characters. It traces the life and intricate interaction of five families in Russia at the time of the Napoleonic Wars, particularly coinciding with the Napoleon's campaign into Russia, which as you have known, which as you know has failed spectacularly. And Tolstoy himself was uh, not uh, in agreement that it should be called a novel. He did not consider it to be a novel. He even wrote in his, in his own exposition in one of the journals that it's neither a novel, nor it is a historical chronicle, nor is it a poem. Because the work brought something new entirely. It was an attempt to, by an author to bring a synthesis of everything that he has gotten to know and experience up to that point. And those of you who are familiar with that work, and it's a very voluminous, and fortunately now, day and age, none of us can afford reading it. It's just, it's just huge. It's Bible thick huge. It was published even in Russian in four books, in four volumes. It was translated into at least, if I am not mistaken, into seven or eight languages immediately upon its publication into Russian and gained tremendous cult-like status, particularly in England, France, and Germany. The work had an immense impact on the intellectual life of Europe, beyond Russia, way beyond Russia. It comprises of Tolstoy's experiments with what could be said gave birth to cinema itself. This is way before the cinema came into existence, even though the, some premonitions of that were given through the experiments in photography. But this precedes that way before the first, first footage. And I don't know how many of you know, the very first moving footage ever was that of the Russian Tsar's family. It's the first historically footage in terms of working of that magic of the screen on, I mean, on the camera on the screen. And it is extraordinary how Tolstoy managed to become a master at his experiments, which arguably were a thing in vogue circa mid to late 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, where this new way of writing almost 
premonitting the rise of cinema, a very different way, literally panning, zooming in, giving characters these angles and views that have not been found in world's literature prior to that, world's literature prior to that. So it's not surprising that War and Peace enjoyed many renderings on the blue screen, as well as being turned into a theater play, into um, many other art forms. Not sure if, if the opera, but certainly a play. And it was, well, maybe just prior to uh, recent times, I'm not talking about the cancel culture, when Russian culture has to be canceled because of geopolitical conundrums of the proxy war of Russia and Ukraine. I'm talking about a bit earlier that even when at the time when I came to England, right at the beginning of the 90s, in the summer of 1991, there was still this kind of like acknowledgement of the greatness greatness of Russian literature on to the world's literature, particularly of the 19th century. You can go and uh, have a crash course about that in New York, in Paris, and I'm sure in Berkeley University, and in many universities around the world, where there are, <coughs> let's say, five greatest Russian writers are given great cross-examination, all of them compactly in the 19th century, all within the... Leo Tolstoy's life was very long. He lived well into the beginning of the 20th century. So what is this war and peace is about? It's an attempt at giving this... what would come towards the end of this very voluminous work as his own philosophical musings on the nature of essence of life, existence itself. But what are, why am I bringing this as an example? There are several reasons we will try to tie them in. One of them, because it connects this whole dilemma, this whole creative tension, this whole dance between the universal consciousness an individual experience. Universal consciousness versus individual consciousness, as we have discussed in our sketches and drawings, given that, um, again, in a nutshell, access into the Trikashaiva thought. What Leo Tolstoy has attempted, and some critics, and there are lots of work dedicated to the war and peace, a lot. You'd be surprised. If you study literature at any of its levels, you cannot bypass war and peace. You cannot. It's like, you know, it, it's a very hard, uh, I would say, decision what to include in the, into the world's, world's literature. Let's not forget, there are epics Epics, the Gilgamesh, the Odyssey, the Iliad, the Ramayan, the, bah the Mahabharata, there are great epics, right, of the ancient times. There are endless list of extraordinary literary examples. What to choose? So if you study literature, Apparently, Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace is unmissable because of what it brings and what it offers in terms of its all-encompassing insights. From composition alone, five families are given in... It's almost like, I'm dying to see latest rendering now. Hey, HBO producers, Netflix, I'm speaking to you folks. Come and sponsor that, do our work as well. But, I mean, sponsor our center, spiritual center. You can have your Netflix little thing in, among the pat patrons. 
But where is the latest run rendering? I'd love to see it. Yeah, we've seen the Orgy Hepburn, you know, and all the other famous um, actors and actresses, but five families and the war, the figure of Napoleon, is also not given just like a sketchy treatment. Napoleon at the time had enjoyed the status of Alexander the Great, greater than life. Napoleon was, at the time of his campaign, has seen in the intellectual circles as someone who is bringing the very aspirations of French Revolution beyond France. So his war was not seen as a war, if you see what I mean. His war was seen as an expansion of intellectual ideas. And Tolstoy made true that it is reflected through the musings and experience of some of his main characters in the war and peace. Because that's what he does. He gives these five families key characters, all of whom are affected by war and interrelationships. And this is where we're going back now to why is it important as an example, extensive that is example, of let's say what we have spoken so far, is that Leo Tolstoy manages masterfully to give this perspective aerial, God, POV-like perspective on the events as well as deeply, intimately personal, psychological in nature experiences of each of its characters, of the main characters, that is. 2,000 players, 2,000 characters, not just sketched, but actually we begin to remember them because they are being brought out throughout. Lengthy passages in untranslated French for the Russian versions, obviously supplemented with the notes. Aristocracy of the time in Russia did not need that. Russian aristocracy spoke French first, Russian second. This is probably some of you know. Not German, even though lots of, like since the Catherine the Great, it was known that Germans, as in terms of their in terms of the minor royalty, became the head of the Russian state, like exemplified in Catherine the Great. But don't get confused. We're not talking about the history of Russia. I hope you're getting the drift. It's the capacity, the ability, the audacity, and the revolutionary way with which Tolstoy manages to give these simultaneous perspectives. Simultaneous perspectives whether this is a perspective of Andrei Balkonsky, one of its main characters, which somehow very hard not to fall in love with because it's like almost an embodiment of that integrity. It's like a Keanu Reeves of our time if we are to kind of like, you know, uh, think of Keanu as that matrix, not so much John Wick, you know. John Wick is a terrible, terrible... <laughs> terrible thing. <laughs> it's the only reason it's watchable is because it's Keanu. <laughs> yeah. So this character, Andrei Balkonsky, whether this is the moment when he lays down on a field this after one of the bloodiest battles, and he doesn't know whether he's alive or not, something, it's experience across borders where he questions whether this is what he's now experiencing, an experience of another realm. Is he transiting? Is he alive? Is this real experience or not? He's lying down the wounded terribly. And he sees these clouds that passing through him, not through him, through the, through the battlefield, these gray clouds mixed with smoke. And he hears the sounds, 
and the sounds come closer, approaching closer, and he hears that the, this is French, and this is French spoken by French, and this is the time when the main character of the book, having this encounter with that man who was encompassing the will of nations at the time, because Napoleon himself is going through the battlefield in a surround, surrounded by just a few of his trusted adjutants and generals, examining, looking, and they standing in right at the body of Andrei Balkonsky. And just like through this barely, barely opened eyes, he could see his figure coming in and out of focus. So whether this is that perspective, deeply internally personal and very cinematic, or the perspective where the battlefield is described from literally that aerial point of view, where the human drama is given a different vantage point, it's given completely different perspective. Totally perspective which is not available to human mind. So these two po extreme points of view, this, the extremes at the different poles of experiences, <coughs> is what has been attempted in the war and peace. And remarkably, this is Tolstoy prior to his conversion into Hinduism, as you may know this. Another interesting fact that Tolstoy's encounter with the Bhagavad Gita led his utter and entire reevaluation of all his beliefs. War and Peace, largely influenced by Arthur Schopenhauer's work, which Tolstoy openly admitted. So it is still, still giving its own renderings and understandings of that what one of the great existentialists of, our, of the 19th century was known for, as Arthur Schopenhauer was. So this is, this is before, before Tolstoy's move to the Bhagavad Gita, which he praised as the greatest spiritual text ever written. So this war and peace, this war and peace, war and peace, the most important concept that comes to us from Vedic culture is that of what is exemplified by that peace. Even the Gayatri mantras all end with that triple shanti. Peace stands as the very important, if not the most important, state, the most important, the most coveted, the most desired condition that all human beings, according to Vedic perspective, one way or another crave. And even if we are to look into the canonical code of Manu, <coughs> which, is the, which forms the basis of Hindu faith, because it comes from that Hindu faith, derives from Vedic culture, it, it is found and springs from that, that perennial understanding until it gains more distinctively religious uh, outlook. But that concept of peace is also exemplified in one of the codes of Manu as non-violence, as you know, very important to Hindus, Ahimsa. Even people who are not deeply familiar with Hindu faith <coughs> and all things Indian, they know. I mean, like, remember the famous bewildering, extraordinary, arresting um, 
message that Mahatma Gandhi purportedly communicated to the government of <coughs> government and the people of the United Kingdom during the Second World War. They should offer no resistance. This Mahatma Gandhi's way itself was considered that that peaceful, peaceful way to win India back from colonial depend not colonial dependency, this is not correctly put, <coughs> from the centuries of colonialism. We know that Mahatma Gandhi was particularly and well he was he gotten to known to be the greatest pacifist, kind of the original pacifist. We know that the ideas of Mahatma Gandhi were influential for someone like Nelson Mandela, <coughs> excuse me, who upon getting familiar and introduced into this, renounced his ideas of how the freedom of South, South African state should be gotten. The fact that he was already in jail makes no difference. The fact that he got introduced into these ideas while he was in that very prolonged period of his life spent in jail. How long was that? Remember? Yeah, exactly. A quarter of his life, basically, in jail. He became a pacifist and communicated these ideas from jail, from his cell, to those who were waiting for everything that would come from that man. And of course, these ideas were ideas that Mahatma Gandhi was coming up with. They are not Gandhi's ideas. These are the very, very principles of ahimsa in action, non-violence, that even to combat violence, non-violence is the only way to combat it. Of course, at the obvious level of affairs, it seems completely and utterly inapplicable. Completely and utterly inapplicable. But we speak about it nevertheless in relation to what we address all along and how this interesting and paradoxical that the fact that this non-violence and the concept of peace which is deeply ingrained in Vedic culture and Vedic civilization at the very same time also paradoxically again accompanied by final resolution where the war is what brings this all to fore. And this is something which is not easy to talk because one runs the risk to get misunderstood there and then. There is a great risk in jumping in with conclusions. But as, I, as has been mentioned earlier, the two greatest epics of India, Mahabharata and Ramayana, have this war. The war is what sets the first straight. How many of you remember the classical, uh, the classic attempt of Peter Brook? No, Peter Brook, mm -hmm. to, with his Mahabharata. Hmm? Do you remember? No. Buy it and watch it. Buy it and watch it. I watched it, I don't know, eight or maybe ten times at least, completely. And there and then, when the kids were growing up, it was kind of like one of the videos we had with us on the road. And at, at any time, you can just... It's one of the great projects that British theatre director, Peter Brook, 
who was not recognized in his own country and he had to leave for France to ex explore and to express his creative ideas where he was greatly re 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 revered and loved and given the chance to work. <coughs> he staged Mahabharata with a truly international cast of actors in an extraordinary way. The premiere took place in India itself and it was several days in an open air. The premiere itself. The, it was an, a historical theatrical event where real fire was used, real water was used, elements were used. Not on, it, for, of course, the stage production that is available today for, you know, like, you, you must watch this. Folks, you, will, you would have great, great joy. The, it's theater at its best, in the sense of how it is composed, how it is conducted. Every frame, the very, very obviously theatrical dialogues, and yet something else slips in there. We know that Peter Brook was lifetime um, follower of the Gurdjieff's four, four waves. Have you heard that? Fourth wave of Gurdjieff? Georgian-born Russian mystic who was at the active and at the very same time as someone like Madame Blavatsky. They were talking about the early 20th century, end of the 19th, early, to early, early 20th century. And Gurdjieff's work was very influential on intellectual life of Europe, greatly influential. More influential than the ideas of Madame Blavatsky because it all blown out completely because the men whom they have been um, fostering, honing to become the Messiah, the famous Jiddu Krishnamurti, dissolved the order which he was honed to lead. Don't know how many of you know. You know the Jiddu Krishnamurti, right? He's a, he's a like. For example, Deepak Chopra, Deepak Chopra considers him one of the greatest influences on his ideas in life, per se. So, Peter's book, Mahabharata, deals with this beautifully, you know, because, of course, it, the, the whole dilemma, the whole conflict, just taking us back now to why am I thought this is relevant to bring here, may become clearer, may become apparent, or it may just sow a seed of your future contemplation, reflection. So this paradoxical coexistence of emphasis on Shanti, on peace, as the highest achievement, it is in peace that all spiritual practice is meant to culminate. Peace is indistinct, like, it's not something that is, can be considered of as one-off. If there is no peace, then what good all this is about? Nothing. If it, didn't, if it does not bring us peace, if whatever we do does not bring us peace, peace then, then everything is in vain. So that very concept of peace is crucial. So look at it now immediately, like change that perspective, that your individual perspective, and look at the global state of affairs. Look at the world at large. Let us change that POV. Let us zoom out from our own problems, from our own, let's say, attempts at our own longing to bring that lost paradise, which is what it means, to attain that everlasting sense of peace, into the, let's say, more aerial perspective. All these peace initiatives in the world, every time there is a war, and the last world war, World War II, prompted the formation of such organization as United Nations. Is it not 
Don't take my words for granted. I'm not at all that versed in all this. I just hear things, you know, like I remember something and I throw it in. Wasn't it formed at the end, of, as a result, as an outcome of the tragedy of the Second World War? An attempt was made, a collective attempt among the nations to come up with something, with some institution that will safeguard peace, is it not? How are they called? They're called peacekeeping forces, no? Peacekeeping forces, that's what they're called. They, mean, they meant to interfere during imminent possibility for an open conflict which will result, as we know very well, as it repeats itself constantly, to loss of human life. And in this respect, particularly the loss of those who are not at all even politically oriented or involved, simply happens to be the casualties of war. Civilians. This is not, we're not talking about men or women, in some countries they serve and you wear uniform, who die in the battlefield. Well, I'm sorry, from ethical point of view, that's a glory. Dying in the battlefield at the time of performing your duty is considered to be an auspicious death. And that's not only, only trying to tap into some of the jihadist ideas. This is, can be found in absolutely every culture. Tell me one culture which did not, did not, not just justified, but did not glorify the one whose duty is to defend the livelihood of its people. Please, give, do me a favor before I get really, really ticked off. <clears throat> Coming to lunchtime. So tell me, please. Give your best shot. Native Americans. <laughs> the whole point was that. Even those who were, like again, back to the Fenimore Cooper. The Fenimore Cooper, you want to understand a thing or two? Authentically, through the eyes of the white man, please read Fannie Mar Cooper. The heart of that man was in the right place, and the mind, likewise, obviously. The way he spoke about Native Americans for the very first time, as the very first writer, was filled entirely with integrity. Oh, admiration. The tribes were very well known, the peaceful tribes and the warrior tribes. The Mohicans were the peaceful tribes, for example. The Lavaras, Mohicans, they were peaceful tribe. Their occupation was not war. Their business was not war. Sioux were, Gurons were. They were known as war tribes. Their sole occupation was war. And yet, in those tribes who were considered to be peaceful tribes, they always had men trained, trained to the highest degree of combat. They were all accomplished warriors. That's the story of the last of the Mohican. When the Uncas, the son of the last great chief of the Mohicans, gives his life to save the life of two women capti who were capti captives of this member of the Gurons tribe who were causing trouble there deliberately, for a, not just for a ransom, it was much more involved. So any other epic, any other country? Whom you want to talk about? Well, we're in Mexico and the Aztecs, they have the war. Exactly. War. Yes, exactly. Well, gods, gods of war exist in every culture. Totally, very, very good addition. But I'm, I'm, I'm simply asking you where it was not glorified for
sons of fathers giving their life in defending the livelihood, lives, and the country of whatever culture that happens to be. I'm just asking to acknowledge this. In ancient Greece, mother sends her son to battle with only one sentence. With the shield or on the shield. With the shield or on the shield, because in ancient Greece, the dead were carried on their shields. The shields were large, different shapes, but they were large enough to carry human body. The mother gives blessing. This was the way of life. Kali Yuga, what have you? We're trying to establish something here. We're trying to locate something here. And in which culture, you tell me, killing civilians was considered to be a heroic act? Name me one culture, please. One. I'll give you help. I'll chip in with my knowledge. Patched up, dusted. At some point, for a long time, and for some, I think, reasons, uh, often historical accounts were made in such a way that everything that is noble was in Rome, and everything outside Rome was barbarian, so what can we expect? But we know that's not true. When its first scholars of India and Asia began to appear, the reevaluation of the greatest of the greatest horrif horrific conqueror of all times, Genghis Khan, was given another viewing. And these scholarly accounts are available. Particularly, Indians were interested in this because he did not perform one ride into India, which he could have easily done. It's something you can look on your own, and it's very, very fascinating. Why Central Asia, where I was born, was burned to the ground. Every city from Balkh, where Rumi was born, and we call him Jalaluddin ibn Balhi, not Rumi. In my culture, where I was born, he's Balhi. Herat, it was Damascus of its own time. Samarkand, all these cities were burned to the ground, leveled. Why? Well, there was this one episode, one episode, when Mongolian delegation went into Central Asia with proposal for a beneficial trade and acknowledgement of them as of their Khan being the ruler with the trade contracts fairly traded. The local rulers of at that time, right, cut the heads of the tradesman delegation and send them back on their own horses. See, this is how they showed, like you do not gonna talk to us like that. So. Genghis Khan saddled the horse and, rule and ran simply through the Asia. And this is interesting, what I came across, and the reason for that is also personal. I was born there, I have Mongolian blood. Vladimir Lenin said, dig any Russian, Mongol. Come on, Russia's paid tribute to Mongol Mongolian Golden Horde for the longest history of Russia of any of, of its conquered times, because it was only Mongols who ever conquered Russia. And during that time, which lasted centuries, 
Russians had to pay a very heavy price until they managed to shook off the Golden Horde. But that, of course, resulted in very rich DNA reshuffling and mix and everything. That's what Vladimir Lenin's uh, uh, kind of uh, known saying is that, you know, Капни любого Russian, uh, капни любого русского, татарин, dig any Russian deep enough, there's Mongolian blood. So not only because of that, but in London I've met and befriended the descendant of the Genghis Khan, Prince Jizar Giray, with whom we became great friends for many, many years who was brought to England at the age of eight, studied in Oxford, and lived pretty flamboyant life. He was a socialite, and the BBC made a documentary of his return to Crimea, because this is the last place where the remnants of the Golden Horde, which broke to. So there was always interest, and I was very curious that in Russia we have this three trilogy on the way the Mongols conquered the world because they did conquer the world, any, the known world at the time. They went as far as the Budapest. And they, his, many historians agree that it was Russia and Russians in terms of its geographical location that served as the buffer zone. Otherwise, otherwise maybe there will be no Lemago and no Salvador Dali attending the Surrealists' gatherings in Paris. We don't know. But what would stop them to run across through the whole entire Europe if they did that through the entire known world at the time, all the way to Egypt? They sacked every single city on the way. But they did not venture with war into India. And this is what Indian scholars took to, took to tackle which <coughs> brings this fascinating, in, uh, fascinating re-evaluations of how what is considered to be unjust. You see, going back to where we have started here, and as I said, a lot of this may sound perplexing and you are left to your own devices to make sense out of it. So this war and peace, this provocative, but not provocative, that title existed prior to Leo Tolstoy. War and Peace already existed in at least two works in French literature. One philosophical and one literally. So this, when we speak about, the, let's say, the greatest epics of India, Mahabharata, and the first one, Ramayana, because that's the sequence. We are perplexed to learn that things are settled through the war. Rama was born to free the world from its greatest demon, Ravana. That's the late motive of the incarnation of Rama, who is considered to be one of the Mahavatars. And these Mahavatars, if you look into this, it's the exposition on the evolution of consciousness. Vishnu take different forms. Different forms. Vishnu as turtle, for example. Vishnu as half human, half animal. As Narasimha. Vishnu as the nearest to us, Krishna a fully formed God, fully fledged God. But altogether, they were known as 10 Mahavatars, with the 10th as like living it in suspense, any time to arrive, maybe, among, maybe amongst us, maybe on his way, but he's apparently supposed to come on a horse, and this time he's coming as a warrior again. He was a warrior in one of his, in two of his incarnations. As Parashurama, prior to Rama, slayer of Kshatriyas. And as Rama, that famous Rama, that famous Rama whose Sita was abducted by Ravana 
and that sets the late motive for Rama to fulfill his destiny, of which he doesn't know. He doesn't even know he is Vishnu. That's the whole point. He doesn't know he's an incarnation of Vishnu. All he knows, he is a prince of Ayoda. He is a prince of a prof prosperous province in India where he is to become a young king in the making, only to learn that he needs to go into exile for 12 years. And his brother Lakshman and his newly wed wife Sita accompany him. So everything is, seems to be like just unfoldment of the epic. All this is, of course, the result of some treachery within the affairs of the court, where the youngest wife, Kalkei, whose mind is perturbed by these very demonic forces, demands from the king who on the eve of the announcement of Rama's king in the making demands fulfillment of one of the promises he gave her and her request is to banish Rama to the forest so that the youngest born in the family who is her son to succeed on the throne. <coughs> this is the late motive. And of course, Ramayana is meant to be read even as at the face value of what it declares at its first opening pages. That Ramayana as a scripture, which is composed on the request of no one but Lord of creation, Brahma himself, and the appointment received by the greatest sage of the time, Veda Vyasa, who delivers. And it is said at the opening pages of Ramayana that mere reading of the verses of these passages of this epic, of the Ramayana, is freeing oneself from all the accumulated scenes. And even advising, encouraging someone to read this, causes tremendous benefits and boons from the divine, from the divine beings, shine, shining beings. So of course all this can be dismissed and all this can be seen like, oh, this is the this is the usual, normal, routine PR. It's done back in the ancient times. But there is something to it, and I that attest to it. I read Ramayana during my years of sadhana. I never read it before. I've heard about it. It's that there was this, it's coincided with the publication, fresh of the print, with the modern rendering by Ramesh Menon. And I could not put the book down. And I was considering myself already that well two years into sadhana, I was like wetting the pages of the book with my tears. Wetting it. And the extraordinary thing is, is that what you experience in Ramayana and the truth of that audacious declaration of the importance of that, the value of that scripture, isn't that by encountering every character, every single character touches certain aspects within our psyche. We connect with that aspect which prior to that we may have bypassed, ignored, preferred it doesn't exist, simply we're unaware. Because it's impossible not to feel into what characters go through. Like, for instance, the last night in the palace where the father calls his son, the king, Rama, and he has to deliver him this news, and the whole palace was in foray of preparation of that inauguration. The whole country, the whole, you know, I mean, just imagine the whole court, the whole court, the whole royal family, imagine like royal family in England, where else are you familiar? Because I think that's the most royal family is constantly thrusted into our face whenever they do something. Mm -hmm. We have to know what's happening in their affairs. You seldom hear what the royal family in Spain or 
Netherlands do, but we need to know what's happening in the royal family of Great Britain. So imagine the whole royal family, Buckingham Palace, everyone, the, the, from the kitchen to the gardeners to the horsemen, <laughs> everyone is busy, you know, preparing for an event next day. I'm just saying, okay, on a smaller scale, more modest, of course, because Ayodhya was just an Indian province at the time. You know, they were not a colony for several centuries, you know, milking every single country and, you know, bringing all that wealth and like wherever you walk in London, in Mayfair and down to the Piccadilly and there's your jaw drops from the sheer amount of wealth on every single building until you visit Windsor Palace for its collection of art and irresistible that is. I'm, I'm talking to myself. It is useful to talk about this. And the father calls his son, and his son is just like, okay, he's just like, imagine blushing, preparing his next, this, this is the most important day of his life. He's to become announced as the heir to the throne. And there's a term, Yuvaraja. So he is like prince in the making, but he's already announced as the king. You see? So that the father gradually delegates his affairs to his eldest son. So father is in distress. Rama comes in, touches, as it's custom, to his father's feet. And the father, in the Rama's father, the king, cannot even look into Rama's eyes. All, all he can do is to collapse into, he collapse into tears. And he just tells Rama, this is what happened. I'm under the oath of this promised word. Obviously, being a king, he cannot just overrule that. He can't tell his wife, oh, I'm sorry, dear, I didn't say that. None of that. You understand the epoch and the sentiment and what needs to be followed through. So he says to him, he says to his son, I will, like, will go ahead as planned. I will just bear the consequences of this, which means he would have to be banished instead. You see? And he says for Rama to go and think about this and come back and tell me your decision. And Rama, doesn't, it doesn't take him a minute to decide. He just kneels down and says, that these are men, this is what men were made of. This is why Rama, there as an exemplar, exemplar, example of the true value of integrity, of being Ram. That quality. There's no need to think. There's no need to reassess the situation. Not, he's not stupid. He's been banished to 12 years in a forest, in a jungle, with wild animals and to eat roots and whatever he can harvest there, whatever he can forage there. Not a sweet meat prepared in the, by greatest chefs of the time. He knows it all, there and then, instead of becoming a king, he's going to become a mendicant in the jungle. But it takes no time to make this decision on the spot, only to bow to his father and walk out of the room, relieving his father from this torment. Of course, it doesn't relieve the father from the torment. This is the scripture on the Dharma. And as we read all these characters, the description of Ravana itself makes you very, very close to being seduced, seduced by the beauty emitted from that demon, even the way it is described, how after the exercises, and he's an accomplished warrior, an accomplished scholar, he subjugated and subdued all planets by receiving highest boon from Shiva himself for performing the hardest sadhana 
All the planets pay tribute to him. They are subdued by Ravana. No planets have impact and effect on him. He's the greatest scholar of the time, the greatest warrior. He comes out of the shower in a description of his masculine, dark body glistering in the setting sun as he puts on white, silky robes. All this, you see, description of the demon. He doesn't rape Sita. No, he doesn't rape Sita. He has a harem of most beautiful women and demonesses. He wants Sita to give herself to him. You see? These, these, all these passages, whilst also we learn how that noble character of Rama, how he loses it all in the fury of when Sita is abducted. So his fate is pushed further into the completion of what he was born for, as the incarnation of Vishnu who came here to restore balance, restore Dharma. And everything culminates in that war when Lanka is being stormed. All this, the arrival of the Hanuman onto the scene and all the army of bears and the monkeys. That's who, who fought, there were no men to fight that war on the side of Rama. See? Because, and I don't want to suddenly wrap it up, I want to develop this. Why is it that the two greatest epics, the Bhagavad Gita, which is a portion of the Ramayana, just like portion, which describes in minute detail the war of the Kurukshetra, and why is the Ramayana itself, as the preceding scripture, preceding epic more rather. It's not a fault to call it a scripture, but it's an epic. Again, again, all settled through the combat and deadly combat to that. So this will become clearer why War and Peace of Leo Tolstoy was brought here. Not just because of that, but because of these two reasons these points of view, the perspectives that all of us also simultaneously carry, even if in potentiality. And we work with these perspectives. And we ought to work with these perspectives. The aerial perspective, the POV, as it were, of cosmic consciousness, of the universal consciousness, and deeply, intimately individual, as well as that perplexing juxtaposition of peace whilst the war settles their affairs. <laughs>